so let's go ahead and get started with this notebook on graphs. Uh, so let's just actually load the packages first. And um, what we will work with here is a data set on airports. Uh, so I'm actually going to load a data set on airports from actually the Vega data sets here. Uh, so it's going to be the airports data and the edges between the airports. So uh, we have a collection of airports, information about them, and um, connections between the airports themselves. So this is inherently a data from a network or a graph perspective. Uh, so yeah, this is uh, the data itself. Uh, and then if we actually want to get the data frame of um, the flight airport here, uh, so this does look like it's a data frame, but it's actually of a different type. So let me actually show you. Um, I think I forgot the exact type, but uh, it's not a data frame. Um, yeah, Vega data set. Uh, so yeah, let's just... Um, convert it to a data frame for ease of communication with the data, I would say. Uh, so we've converted to a data frame here. And next, what we will do is, um, all right, so before I actually, actually, yeah, let's, let's keep going here. Um, the next thing I wanted to do is uh, kind of get a unique uh, vector of all the airports represented in this data set. Uh, so what I'm doing is uh, I'm concatenating uh, the column of urge origin and column of destination of the um, uh, origin destination data set. Uh, so I'm just concatenating them and finding the unique airports. Uh, once I found the unique airports, I'm actually, um, yeah, I'm actually going to go back to the airports uh, data set itself because it has way more uh, airport. So like if you see here, um, you will see that this data actually has, let's see, yeah, more than 3000 airports. Uh, but when I actually looked at just the edges connecting these airports, I found out that there is only uh, 305 unique elements. So I'm just going to do pre-processing on the data to just get the airports that I actually really need. Um, the way I'm going to do it is just look for, um, in the airport's data frame, uh, look, again, I'm converting it here for a data, in, to a data frame. I'm just going to look at the ones that have the IATA number or ID, which is a unique identifier of each airport in uh, the world, uh, to look uh, for where it is, if it is in the unique airport's data set. Um, and if it is, or actually, no, for every unique airport, I'm going to look in the data frame. And um, if it is, we'll keep it, and if not, we won't keep it. Uh, so these are the subset airport IDs that we're actually interested in. Uh, so yeah, now we have only 305 airport identify or airport information. Um, yeah. All right, so moving on, we're going to be working with graphs in this uh, notebook. And one thing about graphs that you should know is this notion of an adjacency matrix. And the notion of an adjacency matrix is really, uh, think of it as a just a matrix, as we saw in the linear algebra uh, notebook, uh, except that's usually a zeros and ones matrix when the graph is undirected. Uh, we're actually going to undirect it here, just indicate that there's a one value between um, element i or airport i and airport j if there's some sort of connection between them, whether it's from to or to from, that's fine. We're not going to worry about it uh, just yet. And we're just going to say uh, an element is one if there is some sort of connection between these two airports, and an element is zero if there is uh, no connection uh, or no immediate one hop connection uh, between uh, these two airports. Because obviously, like if the graph is connected, there is a connection, but you might have to take multiple airports. Uh, okay, so this is where we are going to create the matrix itself. So we've extracted the EI IDs and then the EJ IDs, so from two. And then we were just imposing that it's going to be a value of one. And then the, um, the number of rows is going to be uh, the length of the UI reports and the number of columns is going to be the number of UI reports as well. And yeah, we're setting it to be a sparse matrix because as you will see, usually graphs are very sparse matrices. Uh, and uh, the next thing I'm doing here is just doing a max over A and A transpose. And the reason I'm doing this is because I'm uh, trying to keep this graph undirected. So here I have only direction between EI and EJ. 
And uh, the reason I'm keeping it, yeah, so I'm keeping it undirected just because like what I'm indicating in this uh, matrix is really just the existence of a connection between these two airports rather than the from to notion. And again, also to keep it a little bit simplified. So uh, this is how I'm doing it here. Uh, one quick thing you can do on sparse matrices in Julia is call this spy function. If you're a MATLAB user, you probably already uh, use this a lot. Um, so this is how I can tell you that this matrix is actually sparse. Um, and then A is actually going to be symmetric here because we've uh, made that on purpose. Now, just a quick detour here. Um, so in this, so so far we've seen kind of the idea of what the graph is going to look like, and we've created a JC matrix that um, uh, corresponds to that graph. So in Julia, there is a very popular uh, light graphs package, which I do recommend using it for um, anything that's like, if you have a graph and you're hoping, like you have a lot of complicated things to run on the graph, light graphs package is a pretty powerful tool to use. Uh, nevertheless, here, I'm just gonna keep it um, kind of simpler with using the matrix networks package, which I'm biased because I'm the author of the matrix networks package. Uh, so I just like know how to use it pretty easily. Uh, and it does focus on um, the graph from a matrix perspective. So uh, we do know like if, if a graph, like it works on the matrix itself and not on the graph. So um, it's just a different way of viewing things. Um, you can do almost essentially everything we're gonna do here from a matrix networks perspective in the lights, pa uh, lights graph package. And lights graph package could actually give you more powerful tools if you're doing more network analysis, but everything we'll do here will be pretty simple and basic from a graph analysis perspective. But just to give you a quick idea, this is how you can build a quick graph here. Uh, you can convert the A, as you see, matrix to a simple graph. You could also start with a simple graph with number of nodes 10 and then keep adding edges to it. Uh, that's another way to do it. Um, but for now, that will be our only detour. And then we'll go back now to the actual uh, IGC matrix A and work on A itself. So one thing that comes up with graphs a lot is trying to find out if the graph is actually connected. Uh, why does this matter? It matters because um, if the graph is disconnected, first of all, that's a very useful piece of information to know. Like if, if you're trying to run, um, say, a system to transport goods across um, a city or a country or a state or whatever, and you know there's no connection from point A to point B, no matter what, like the graph is actually disconnected. Well, that's a very useful piece of information uh, to know. Like you want to know that. Uh, so a quick way to do it here in um, uh, matrix networks is by calling the S component uh, function on A. So what S component says is um, basically it gives you all the components of um, the graph. And by components, I mean it gives you all the all the connected components of the graph. Uh, so here, when I call the cc.sizes uh, subfield of um, cc, uh, it's gonna be 305, which that means there was only one component and there was a 305 uh, nodes in that component. Uh, if I had more than one component, um, the, the, the c.sizes vector is gonna have, however, the length of it is gonna be however, many connected components I have, and each value in independently will have the number of nodes in that component. All right, so we'll move on from the S components uh, function now and go to the degree distribution of uh, a matrix. And a degree distribution, or a graph, I mean, a matrix is a graph and a graph is a matrix in my head, so just so that you know. Uh, so uh, yeah, the first thing we're gonna do is get the degrees of these nodes in this graph. And the way we're gonna do it is by just getting uh, the summation of each column or each row, it doesn't matter that matrix A is uh, symmetric anyway. Uh, and then what I'm doing here is I'm plotting uh, the actual degree distribution uh, on the right hand side and then a log distribution or the log value. Uh, notice that I can just do y axis equal to uh, log column log, which is a symbol here. Uh, can just transform um, the y axis into a log scale. Uh, so, one thing I would want to say here is being able, again, like this is stuff, like this is still, we're still kind of like understanding what the graph is. Um, being able to understand what your degree distribution is or like taking a look at the degree distribution before you start processing your graph is also a very beneficial tool you might want to use. Uh, so I do recommend 
looking at S components and looking at uh, the degree distribution before you start with your uh, processing. All right, so moving on, I'm just gonna actually pick the largest, um, uh, I'm just gonna pick the largest, um, the node or the airport with the largest number of edges or number of nodes it's connected to. And um, very non-surprisingly, <laughs> uh, this airport is Atlanta. So yeah, if you've traveled in the US, you would know that <laughs> almost always you have to, or a lot of times if you're going East Coast to West Coast, and, uh, Atlanta has a lot of stops, so it's one of the uh, one of the hubs for a lot of actually. Um, uh, actually, no, I think it's just a hub for Delta. But anyway, it, it does have a lot of connections. Um, so yeah, Delta Atlanta is the airport that we're interested in here. And then what we're gonna do next is actually plot or the connect all the connections from Atlanta. So here we're doing something very similar in the we did in the clustering. Um, uh, notebook where we set up, uh, this is the height and width of the canvas, like we're setting up uh, here is the um, the actual shape of the United States, which you can get it from uh, the Vega data set uh, just by calling data set on us-10m. And then um, what we're doing here is that we're plotting a scatter plot of uh, the airports themselves. Uh, so each one is going to be a circle in its latitude and longitude. And then next, we're actually plotting all the connections uh, from Atlanta. So the origin is Atlanta, and then we're looking up where is an origin and getting all the IATA IDs of those connections and then finding the latitude and longitude um, and uh, doing um, the, same, the same thing there. Uh, the other way around also just looking as a destination on Atlanta. Uh, so that's how we're actually plotting the edges via this last uh, part over here. And as you can see, there's way too many edges coming out of the, from Atlanta. All right, so now we're actually going to start with the actual uh, processing on some of these, um, um, these types of problems. Uh, so one question that comes up a lot is like, again, if you're trying to optimize like distribution of goods or something like that, uh, is the shortest path problem. How I can, how can I transfer um, a certain uh, good from point A to point B uh, in, uh, by taking the shortest segments or by taking the shortest uh, number of paths uh, here. So one way you can do it is via the Dijkstra's algorithm. And Dijkstra is also a method from uh, matrix networks here. So if I run this, um, you can get all the shortest paths from uh, Atlanta to all the other things. Uh, so one thing I'm just going to visualize here is, uh, so I'm just going to get what is the point that is farthest away from Atlanta in terms of a uh, graph distance, so like how many edges do I have to go uh, to get to it? And um, there's actually, um, yeah, so Atlanta paths of one, so this is actually a tuple, and the first element in that tuple uh, has all the distances to all the other nodes. So actually, let me uh, show it to you here. Um, so yeah, these are the distances in terms of edges. How many edges do I need to get to each of these points? And if you actually see um, this, for instance, it's going to be zero because from Atlanta to Atlanta, you, you need zero edges. All right, so getting the maximum value here is actually three. So what I'm going to do is try to track down like how 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 many where are the stops that I need to get to this uh, point, um, which is the arg max of this value. Uh, so first of all, I'm just going to get um, the arg max. So this is the last stop. This is um, basically um, the the place that needs three hops to get to from Atlanta. And then uh, I'm just going to show them here. So that was um, airport number 123 and the unique airports that we um, made the mapping from. And that airport is actually GSD. I'm not sure what GSD is. I wasn't like it's, it's a, apparently a very small airport. And then the next stop, we're going to go back from GST and see, oh, like what was the thing just right before it? And we can use that by using the second element of the Atlanta paths. And that, that's going to just tell me what was the predecessor before getting there. That's like the predecessor vector from the extras algorithm. And we'll see that the predecessor was JNU. And then if you actually keep going, we're going to see that it was Seattle. 
And then if we actually keep going, we're going to see it's Atlanta. So we actually reach where we're looking for. And if I plot this, all right, so this finished working. Oh, I know why it took a little longer than I had even expected. And that's because I think I passed the entire, yeah. So uh, I'll do the data subset next time. But anyway, so here it's actually, yeah, three, three hops. And uh, you probably can't see it, but it's one hop, two hops, and then there's a tiny little hop over here. Uh, so these are the three uh, segments. All right, so moving on, another function that comes up in graphs a lot is the MSD or minimum spanning tree. And the reason you would use a minimum spanning tree is because sometimes you want to um, span from, from the name of the function, span a network or connect a network in a way that is using uh, the least number of edges. So like imagine you're trying to build uh, roads between all of these cities and uh, well you can create roads here because you have Atlanta uh, sorry you have Alaska but anyway think of it as just like a um, map on one uh, lens and you're trying to uh, create um, a connection between all of them to not keep the graph disconnected yet use the, mo uh, the least number of uh, roads here the question is how can you keep it connected and use the least number of uh, connecting flights between a pair of uh, airports? So you can actually look at the documentation here. And we're actually just going to go ahead and call it on the matrix A. And I'm just going to skip over some of the details here of how we're building it. Uh, we're really not doing anything uh, super uh, new. We've done, we've done very similar things so far. And now instead of um, using the edges uh, from any lookup or anything like that, we're actually just going to, uh, sorry, from any uh, origin or anything like that, we're just going to plot everything from EI to EJ. And this is how things are going to look like. Uh, I'm not going to rerun this just because it might take a minute or so. Um, but yeah, this is how things are going to look like. And so one more thing which always also comes up in terms of uh, graphs is the page rank function so page rank is uh, this algorithm or this uh, method that came up uh, came out actually kick-started google and that came out of google <laughs> uh, so yeah it kind of it was the method that started google and the idea was to uh, rank uh, web pages so you can think of web pages on the internet as also a web right like nodes are nodes are uh, web pages and edges are connections. If there's a link referencing uh, a web page on your current page, then there's an edge between you. Uh, so that's the World Wide Web, if you want to think about it that way. And PageRank uh, was this algorithm, or is this algorithm that uh, gives you a ranking of um, interesting, or yeah, gives you a ranking of the web pages or the nodes that you uh, could be interested in, given uh, a state you're being you're at. Uh, this is the overall uh, idea. Uh, but if you also you weren't at a state, like you weren't at a specific node, uh, one way to do it is to also run PageRank on um, essentially assuming you where uh, the probability of you being on any node is uh, equally possible on all nodes. So you can run PageRank on the entire uh, network that way. And what that does is kind of uh, gives, you, uh, gives you an idea on how important each uh, node is in your network. So a higher PageRank value uh, means that the node is uh, most likely more important. Uh, so it's just a ranking method you can use on networks. So here I'm just going to use uh, matrix networks page rank on A. And then this alpha value is just, I'm going to skip over the details of what alpha is, but a common value to use is 0 0.85. Um, all right, so yeah. Uh, so V here is summing to one, so sum of V is equal to one. So think of this as like probability distribution. How important is each node as a probability if I want to divide the probabilities over all these sets of uh, nodes in my graph? I'm going to actually insert it here to the airport's data set, and I'm going to plot the airports via the page rank values. And now we'll find out that um, Atlanta is actually one of the biggest, so it makes sense that, uh, or one of the highest degrees. So it makes sense that it has a very large page rank value. And yeah, all the things that exist here that have a high, um, uh, big circle actually kind of make sense. Um, yeah, so there's probably here San Francisco, uh, LAX. Um, so yeah, uh, Salt Lake, I think. Uh, so that also makes sense because it's, I think, a Delta hub. So yeah, all these values actually do make sense. 
All right, and finally, the last topic we will cover in this notebook is clustering coefficients. And the reason clustering coefficients is um, important or matters by to understand your uh, network is because uh, clustering coefficient tells you about how uh, likely to have, um, so if, if a clustering coefficient of a value of a node is high, it means that uh, it tends to cluster with uh, the nodes connected to it. Uh, so if a node is connected uh, to, uh, let's say, 10 other neighbors, and the 10 neighbors are all connected to each other, then this node has a high clustering coefficient, it's, it's one, because it has a tight cluster. Uh, so that could give you an idea of how like each node in your uh, network, how how related it is to the cluster that it belongs to. Uh, another, so a quick way to do it in Julia or in matrix networks is to call the cluster coefficients uh, functions on A. Uh, one quick thing to note here, sometimes actually um, the values you'll get here is like super tiny. Uh, and just because I'm gonna pass them later to um, this plotting um, um, paradigm, I'm just gonna set them to zero. So anything um, less than the epsilon here, um, I'm just going to decide that it's zero. So this is how I'm going to run this. I'm going to insert the column itself. And again, I'm not going to run this cell here, but uh, you should be able to run it. Um, what I'm doing here is um, just basically plotting very similar to PageRank, except that the value here is based on the uh, clustering coefficient value. Uh, and as you can see, a lot of these nodes actually have a pretty good clustering coefficient. There's very few that has a small ones, but um, yeah, that's, that's, that's something to note here. And then finally, I hope you can check off all of these lists here. Uh, the one cool finding that I have here is that, um, yeah, like all these hubs that we know of uh, do actually have a pretty high page rank value. So nothing super uh, shocking here. So, but it's good to know that page rank actually agrees with that. And with that, uh, I'll end this notebook and I'll see you in the next notebook. Thank you.